Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I was just waking everybody up. <laughs> yeah, a little tap never hurts anything. Um, so, what I was, how I was hoping to um, start off the conversation today about scaling, um, which I think we've heard numerous times. Um, within the community being talked about, but primarily kind of understanding it from each of your career perspectives. So the first question that I had was, um, if you could each give us a quick one minute, 90 second uh, overview of your career to date. So imagine an elevator pitch, but uh, about your career. Um, does anyone want to start? Cam? <laughs> sure. Fine, I will start. Um, yeah, my career path over the last I don't know, eight years. Um, I started as a server, yeah. a topless server, <laughs> in a nightclub when I was 18 years old. And, uh, you know, I. Which nightclub was this? <laughs> the Speakeasy. I'm just kidding. Uh, it, was a, it was a club in Calgary, Alberta called Tantra. My club, <laughs> it's no longer there. Uh, I was fresh out of school. Um, I wanted to get into, you know, the nightlife, so uh, I started serving topless drinks. And uh, I, you know, I really enjoyed the atmosphere, I enjoyed the energy, and I really loved the space I was in, so uh, I moved up very quickly and uh, became the GM uh, two years later, uh, and then went on to run uh, Cowboys Nightclub. It's uh, a, a, one of the biggest bars in North America. Out in, uh, out in Calgary, and I was the GM there for a few years, and uh, decided that the late nights, the outrageous amount of tequila, and uh, the partying was not gonna last forever. Uh, so I decided to move on. And uh, a few partners and I, we bought uh, the restaurant chain from the president of the company, and uh, when I was 24 years old, uh, I ended up going to run restaurants, and uh, we took, a failing business from one location to seven locations across uh, Alberta and BC. And then uh, I landed in Vancouver 2014 after I resigned and started Fitplan. Awesome. That's quite the journey. Um, the restaurant business is one of the toughest businesses to be in, so I always find that fascinating, people who come from that space. Um, do you want to yeah, I'll, add I'll on to that? Yeah, I'll take a stop. Never serve topless. I think I'll <laughs> you're missing out. You could out. today yeah, if you'd out. like. Yeah, <laughs> that's, what, that's my next role. Um, topless no. coding. Yeah, topless coding. That's a thing. Maybe. Who knows? Um, so, uh, I'm from Vancouver. I grew up here. Did my high school here. Saw some, seeing some high school buddies of mine uh, from Vancouver College. Um, went to Stanford for undergrad and grad school. Um, I've always been really wanted to do, do things that are both interesting, technically very difficult, but also meaningful. And so that's been the thing that really motivates me and drives me. And uh, so halfway through my PhD, I had a call with my mom, say, hey, mom, this is super interesting, <laughs> but uh, I'm not, never gonna help anybody with this PhD. So um, I decided to drop out. I was doing research in machine learning. And I uh, landed, uh, landed a gig in, at Square because I was a really bored grad student and answering questions on Quora can land you a job at a startup in, in San Francisco. And so the company was 50 people when I started, uh, scaled to 550 by the time I left. Um, and after that, joined a startup that didn't go anywhere, so saw startups that really realized its potential, also saw startups that kind of fell flat on its face. Um, and then about five years ago, Keith, who was a CEO at Square, reached back out, and that's how I got introduced to Eric and JD, and we started Open Door about five years ago. So the company has grown super quickly now. Today I serve as a CTO. The company is about 1,300 people over five years, so it's been pretty tremendous to see that growth. Um, but yeah, that's my story so far. That sounds exciting. Wow. Um, well, um, you know, you are right. I, I, I've been a technologist since I was 11. Uh, I was one of those kids that was more comfortable around a computer than, than the playground. And uh, I, I say 11 because that's the first software package I actually got paid for and had to do taxes and all that stuff. So, so that's officially uh, the kickoff to the career. But coming from a good Asian family, my dad wanted me to be a doctor, so I, I did two years of biology and genetics at UBC um, got in a lot earlier, uh, but through a series of misadventures, that seems to be a theme in my life. Uh, things tend to go where your heart is. There's a natural way where you sabotage things that aren't where you want to be and you naturally go towards where you are. And that's how I ended up in tech. Uh, I ended up being an intern at UBC, 
that's how I ended up at Microsoft. I was making $350 a week, so that gig there is like <laughs> double the pay, just so you know. So that's not entirely bad. And um, I had the good fortune in my young 20s to join a, a group of entrepreneurs, uh, fellow UBC students. Um, we founded a company called Mindquake and uh, grew that to like $8 million a year in revenue. And uh, it was a complete blur, uh, great partners, really hardworking, really smart guys. And in many ways, it was a disservice because you assume that everything's always going to be like that. You're always going to have great partners. You're always going to have great customers. And it's always going to be you know, the dot-com bubble days. But reality is not that. Um, and then we witnessed not just the rise of Mindquake, but the uh, demise of Mindquake, which is uh, you know, very hard building a company with 60 of the most people that you care about deeply and having to shut that down. Uh, but I never looked back. Um, Microsoft <clears throat> was officially my last employment position, and that was 1998. Since then, I've been founding companies. Um, so I've done professional services, co professional services companies and then got more into the product side. And uh, six years ago, um, was being a management com consultant to a company called REV that made electric vehicles. And Mojo came out of that. Uh, electric vehicles weren't taking off the way everybody expected. And um, the idea for Mojo came up. And uh, one of the things I'd learned at this point was building a big product, a, a global product, you know, something to do with cars as a gro global product, is just as hard um, to do as something small. Uh, it's a lot harder to do something small, actually. So anyways, um, was co-founded uh, co founded Mojo with a great group of people. Um, and now Mojo is a category leader in connected cars and uh, a Vancouver success story. So, um, And I'll conclude. Uh, everybody's been asking me what's Traxit. Um, I left Mojo a year ago. Uh, I, I tend to be that guy who I'm not really good at running companies. I'm, I'm good at hacking through the jungle and finding El Dorado. But once you've found El Dorado, other people are good at mining. Uh, they're, they're good at coming in and you know, taking, taking the gold out, out of the territory you found. But I'm more an adventurer, and I like to get out there into uncharted territory. So. Yeah, there's um, kind of a correlation between each of your stories, and it has to do with work. So um, I'd love to kind of hear what your definition of work is. Um, I think it's something that we tend to not recognize until we take a step back of um, how much work we put into things. So um, if you'd like to take that on, Ian. Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, I got in trouble once for trying to recruit a, um, a candidate. And the candidate asked me, hey, Ian, how many hours do you work a week? And Ikshar got mad at me because I uh, talked about work-life integration. And I think that's totally not PC. And I'm going to, this should never be recorded because <laughs> Ikshar is going to get mad at me again. Um, and because I, I think of like, <laughs> I think of work and life, and actually Jeff Bezos has a really good quote about this, which is work-life harmony. And the way I think about work is actually, it's just problem solving. I don't think of work as like work. It's like there's a problem in front of you, you need to solve it. And it's just that in some cases, you get paid for solving some problems. Um, and that's my definition of work is that I have these really hard problems, be they technical problems, be they product market fit problems, business development problems. And the question becomes, how do you actually like to take that problem, modularize it, and solve it? Um, so that's how I think of work. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the saying goes, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And, you know, I built a company around my lifestyle, uh, something that, you know, I highly enjoy doing every single day. Uh, so it's not like I work hours in a day. It's just a part of what I do. It's, it's, I, I see it as taking specific actions every single day to move you, move you closer to your goals. Uh, so, you know, obviously, you know, they say work hard, work smart. But, um, you know, like Ian said, it's all about problem solving and how you manage those problems. Uh, you know, never, never ask for smaller burdens, ask for broader shoulders. So um, I think integrating uh, in your life something you enjoy to do is gonna make it uh, that more enjoyable and obviously successful. Well, um, I'm gonna take a twist on that. I, I call work everything I don't like doing work uh, because a lot of what I, I have been doing is play. Um, just by virtue of having gotten into computing because I just loved computing and then had this thing in my life where I was kind of denied computing because I had to go into med school and all that and you know computing became a hobby then to have it become a career again it was like wow I can't believe I get paid for this I'll take two, 350 that sounds good uh, <laughs> but um, 
you know, to me, what work is, is uh, getting a great group of people together, picking a worthy problem, and just throwing everything, your entire intellectual ability at it. And um, it feels more like a team sport where you've got, you know, if you look at rugby or sailing or any of these sports where you've got different types of expertise, um, that's what work is to me. And normally, um, what excites me is always interesting mountains to climb. So one where you do require the expertise of someone who's been there, done that in sales and someone who's build, been there, done that in marketing. Um, that to me is more play, I call it play, and I could do it all the time. Uh, but it is not very different than what you do you know, yourselves, if you're a graphic artist or, or a marketer or a salesperson and so on. Um, that there's no difference between what people up here do for work. The difference is how the type of community you work with, and by community I mean the enterprise you're involved in. I think I, I define it very differently. And uh, I've had the pleasure of having some people who are just aces. When you see a marketer who really knows what they're doing, and, and you know you have a, a pamphlet knowledge of marketing, and then you see a pro do their stuff, or sales or something, and then you realize, oh crap, I'm the technologist, and I have to play at their level. Um, that's work, and that's a lot of fun, and you're, you don't want to let coach down, you don't want to let the team down, so. Anyone want to add to that, or? I mean, it's funny, because like, I, I really resonate with that point, which is work and play are oftentimes intertwined. Um, there are obviously like a shitty part of work, right? There's like, you know, no one ever looks forward to like a tough performance conversation with a report. Like that's work. Um, but at the same time, like Saturday mornings, you wake up, what's the first thing you think about? Sometimes that, that's actually about work. And you actually wanna wake up and actually, you're excited to solve it. And so when someone will ask you, hey, why are you spending your Saturday mornings working? It's like, I don't really feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm t like pushing something forward uh, that I really enjoy. Um, so I totally resonate with that point. Do you kind of think that the definition of work is oftentimes seen in a negative context in today's world of this idea of work-life balance, which I personally don't have at all, and I feel like a lot of individuals, and sometimes it's revered not to have that work-life balance, but it's just hard work I don't feel like is often um, looked upon as it used to be. Right, it's like work work smart, not hard. Or um, you know, you have to have that balance in your life, and it's just. I, anyways, I'm just going on a tangent, but could you add to that? Like, is that something that you feel like you often experience with individuals of ha when you hire them? Yeah, I think so. I think like it. It really defines. It depends on how you define work. I mean, like you should be putting in work in everything that you do, both personally and professionally. So even if you're doing something that's outside of your business, you're still working at something. So um, I feel like people that are goal-driven and they wanna you know, live a big life, they're always working on something regardless if it's professional and personal. So I think it's around how you frame uh, that narrative around work is gonna make the difference. And the, way, the one thing I would add is, is also about focus. I think the, really, this might not be a popular opinion, but it really depends on how, much, how far you want to take things and how successful you want to be in your field. And I haven't seen anyone who's successful who's not obsessed. And now that doesn't mean that you are sleeping four hours a night. Actually, there's a great book called Why We Sleep. <laughs> you all should read it. Um, I try and get over seven, hopefully sometimes seven and a half hours of sleep every night. Um, but it's about really optimizing your life so that you're able to focus on the things that matter. And so again, like, I, I don't think I've met a successful person who's not obsessed about the thing they're working on. But again, it doesn't mean that they're hustling and like grinding themselves down day in, day out. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a topic near and dear, but my, my experience has been exactly that. Um, you, you work because you're obsessed with the problem. So that resonates with me definitely. The, the thing I've seen here is, you know, I've, I've been in rooms where the boss or whatever chastises the team and why you're not here on the weekend and all that. And to me, that's an example of a leader who's got it wrong. Um, I, I could say something more controversial, but honestly, if you've got the right people, <laughs> that's bullshit. Let's hear it. <laughs> uh, if, if, you've, if you've got the right problem and you've got the right group of people in the room, they are just gonna throw themselves at it if, because you've created the right conditions. Uh, I'll tell you another thing. Uh, you, you end up with people with the right judgment. So. I have, you know, when I was an intern at Microsoft, I, my boss wandered into work on a Saturday, completely hungover. Um, he'd, he'd wanted to meet me on Saturday, and, and I was working, 
And you know, he walked over to my desk and, and there were paychecks I hadn't deposited, there's a pile of paperwork. This is before the internet, so you had to have binders and manuals on your desk. And I was there on a Saturday because I was obsessed with this parsing problem. I just like, I needed to nail it, I had to solve it. And, and that's what was driving me. It wasn't Lance telling me, dude, you gotta get this done by Friday. That wasn't it. It was, I can, why is this so hard? And that was what's driving me there. Um, what, you know, in terms of your obligations, work life, uh, particularly when, you're, when I was in my 20s, I didn't have any family obligations. Now I have a wife, I have kids. I'll tell you this, the ROI on a divorce is awful. Like nobody, nobody out there goes, hey, I'm willing to give up half everything you worked on. That is not what you got married for. That's not the commitment that, you made. That's why so. you have to live in the right jurisdiction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you have to put that in context. And if someone is telling you you've got to work, and you don't feel it deep down, then the motivations are all wrong. And you better have that conversation. You're just delaying it. And all three of you kind of touched upon a common theme yet again, um, and it's passion in a way. So with that being said, like we, I heard a little bit about why you work and that obsession you have. Um, what motivates you, each of you? Like what are you working on right now that you're kind of obsessed with? Yeah, um, well, what motivates me is, is people. There's obviously problems, but, you know, with, with Mojo as an example, we were, we were at one point a five-person company, and then we were a 30-people company, and we had senior executives, like VPs from TELUS, Rogers, Deutsche Telekom. These are companies with 200,000 employees, and we had access to these people. We were meeting them. Either they were coming to our office or we flew to meet with them. And when we met with these group of people, they were career people. I mean, they, you know, we had individuals at Deutsche Telekom had been there for 14 years. Now, for someone at that level to make a bet on a tiny little company in Vancouver and us not delivering, that's a career killer. That's somebody's 14 years of hard work and reputation gone. Um, I couldn't live with that. There's no way my team could live with that. And we all knew uh, this person's betting on us and we're not going to disappoint them. I think that, like as a salesperson, that's always the big thing of like never disappointing the client. Um, and, you know, trying to explain that to the rest of your team of like, this person's betting on us. They're hedging a bet as a startup. And that's quite a rare thing when a person takes a chance on you. So I can't imagine that at that scale that you're going through. Um, do you have something, anything to add to that, Ian? I, I mean, all, all of us are obviously for individuals and motivated by different things. I think that mo I'm kind of a naive idealist. So okay. the things I'm serious, like that's Isn't kind that of what an idealist. Yeah. That, well, the naive part is you know an, an adjective, but um, the thing that motivates me is. Um, being able to solve really hard, big societal problems, and it sounds naive and, and idealistic, but really that's what drives me. It's really corny. Um, but really the reason why I was attracted to Square was like, hey, what if you can actually empower everyone with access to the economy and participate in the economy by actually accepting payments? For Open Doors, what if you can change that bit of fear in people's heads where people are afraid to move because they have to buy and sell a house? What if you can actually remove, eliminate that uncertainty and fear entirely? Wouldn't like how crazy would that be to create a society that's truly mobile um, and geographically free? And I think that's the thing that's these big audacious goals that I think, wow, like if that statement is true about society, society would be very different. And I think that's the thing that drives, drives me. I think it's really interesting to think through what the world would look like with that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I'm... Hmm outrageously motivated every day. I mean, we run a health and fitness company, so uh, we're just improving human happiness on a daily basis. So, you know, it's incredible to see the countless success stories that, you know, surface from our community and people that are literally changing their lives through using our product and being inspired and engaged through what we do. Um, so, I mean, that alone is enough motivation to get my ass out of bed every day and push as hard as I can and really show up as my best. So. Um, you know, I, I'm super grateful to be in the space I'm in just because I get to see the impact I have on individual humans on a daily basis. So, so people and change, if, that, if I could sum that correctly. And, you know, the change side of things, I think, is um, so core to, to working in technology, right? Like if you want to stay at a company that's stagnant, 
not that they're stagnant, but like you work for a bigger company, right, where there's that security. Um, but startups are the opposite. You're you're constantly evolving. Um, Narayan and I was speaking speaking earlier today, and it's like every six months, it's like out with the old, in with the new. Um, with that being said, um, can you share where you are in your career right now and what's changing and evolving and that you're excited about? I'll start, I think. One of the interesting, interesting aspects of being in a startup is that things are always changing. Yeah. Um, we went from literally four of us five years ago to 1,300 people today in five years. Um, that's, that's a lot of growth. I don't know what the annual compound of growth you is. Know I, yeah, I go to a building sometimes. <laughs> like we have office, like 20 offices across the country, and I would go into an office like, hey, how's it going? I'm Ian. Um, so, but, but your job description just changes every three months, every single relationship between you and your coworker is dynamic, is different. The playing ground, the, you know, the, the playground with respect to competition and the ecosystem is changing. Consumer expectations, five, five, years, five years ago, we told customers, hey, you know what, you can sell your home to open door. People were like, wow, what's a catch? How are you scamming me? Now they're like, obviously this is how things are done. And so, holy crap, like people aren't, are taking this for granted. How do we then take that to the next level? So the, the, the career, when I think of the career and where I am, it's kind of hard to say because things have never been constant over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. Hopefully I'm still at the beginning of the career, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, we kind of had a small conversation about this is, you know, FitPlan, we kind of started it essentially 2014. Uh, so it's been just over five years. And, you know, it feels like a long journey but then you look back and it feels like just yesterday, uh, everything is still so fresh and so new and constantly you know, you're, you're solving new problems that come up obviously in your market, competition, uh, how you uh, solve technical challenges, all that sort of stuff. So um, I mean like just being able to be adaptable and nimble and you know, be mindful of what's happening in your space I think is, is a great place to be. Um, um, myself, uh, I feel like I'm at the midpoint, although if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have felt at the midpoint of the career. Um, you know, I, I'm one of these people that I feel like I've been like Alice in Wonderland. I've gone to Wonderland and come back. And, and by that, I mean, you know, Mojo was my first company that, that is global. We operate in seven countries. Uh, there are more countries coming on board. And we have offices in the Valley, Europe. Um, um, you know, and, and Toronto, Vancouver, Seattle. So once you've seen what it takes to accomplish that, you realize, okay, that was hard work, but it is really doable. And you know how to do it, the types of people you need to do it and where they are, and you kind of have the ability to pick up the phone and call them. So given that, uh, and the second aspect is, throughout my career in tech, there's always kind of been like one wave. You know, there was, there was a desktop, software wave and then there was a little bit of multimedia CD-ROM wave and then the web took over. This CD-ROMs are done? I know. Like CD <laughs> and remember Encarta? I don't know if anyone here remembers. Um, and, and now uh, in tech, there, that statement, you, how prophetic it was that software is taking over the world, is eating the world, um, there are now multiple fronts. There's the AR front and I don't believe AR has delivered anywhere near what it can do, and, and vir virtual reality, and you know AI, and all these things. They are all, uh, there are so many fronts in tech right now that are A, getting funded, and B, can be thrown at really interesting problems. Um, by virtue of my personal expertise, I'm, I'm in that domain of AI and, and cloud computing at scale. So that's, that's why I'm making myself available to businesses with interesting problems. Um, but I would encourage anyone out there uh, to look at their skill sets and, and find that right team. But because it's never kind of been like this where there are five different areas you could go to that are, are growing at the pace that they are. And, and by the way, they'll all go through a trough of disappointment, you know, blockchain or whatever. They'll all go through not living through the hype. That always happens. But eventually there's uh, value that you can create. So. They have Asian moms as well? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. But, I'm going to uh, keep that theme going. Right. <laughs> well, the, well, the interesting thing about what you said just now, I think, is very true. Like, careers, it's, it's hard to talk about one career because mm -hmm. so, mo so many times there's actually multiple careers. And actually, the career actually corresponds with the industry that you're in. 
So one of the, you talked about CD-ROM, you talked about Encarta. Yeah. My, my first te like technology job was actually in a hardware company because I was actually double E, electro electrical engineering undergrad. So I thought I was gonna be a chip designer. And because like Silicon Valley, like silicon, right? So I worked uh, in San Jose at this technology company and I realized like, holy crap, hardware is dying. And the skill set that I had spent four years of my undergrad developing was actually kind of obsolete. And I think the only constant is really cheesy is like things keep changing. Like, there, like the set of tools as a software engineer that you learned in 2011, like half of that, I mean the concepts are the same, but the actual tools, tools themselves have just completely been overhauled to the point where the tools that you would need to learn today are almost like completely different from the ones that you learned in like just ten, nine, 10 years ago. So I think the, even the term career needs a bit of redefining. Go ahead, Ian. <laughs> yeah, Ian, ha let's have that yeah. moment. Um, no, you, I think you're completely right. Like that idea of career, it's it's not a linear path anymore. And you 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 tend to take breaks, or you you go in avenues that you haven't explored. And um, and I think that has a lot to do with scaling, which is kind of our next topic. But before we jump into that, are there any questions in the audience regarding career and how these three fine gentlemen uh, have gotten there? Come on up. Um, let me just take the mic over to you, you both. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll run it. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, though. Booyah. Booyah. <laughs> Sorry, I love that name. Yeah, it's like Booyah with P. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thanks for sharing your stories. I want to ask, I, I, I think I know Cam's and uh, Arianne's answer because we talked. We're neighbors, actually, all of us. But uh, uh, I want to know, Ian, like the Peter Thiel question, what is the one thing that you believe that most people disagree with you on? That's a, that's a lot of question. Um, <laughs> What's well, one thing I believe in that no, not everyone else believes in? I, I think the tough thing is like, if you're on Twitter and you're in Silicon Valley, like, you know, generally if you're on Twitter, like there are just so many different views at this point that like every single view that you can state, there's gonna be someone who believes in it. So it's kind of hard to have some true contrarian view. Um, but I, I do think education, um, couple of things. I, I do think that education, the our education system, having gone through many, many years of post high school education is really broken. Um, I don't know if that's contrarian at all. Um, and the other thing that I believe in, but that's two things, is I, I do think that we vastly underestimate human expertise. Vastly, vastly, oh, sorry, vastly overestimate human expertise. Vastly underestimate how much simple counting can get us. I was talking to someone about like, um, just like any time you, you like use a service where someone says that you're an expert, but there's no way you can check, and that includes almost, almost like 90% of the industry, industries out there, that they're ripe for disruption. Because like there's a ton of just charlatans out there. Um, and so I, I would state that any industry where there's quote, the word expert involved, where you cannot check the expertise, it's, it's, it's uh, bogus. Um, that includes like medicine, that includes law, that includes education. Like I think a lot of things are really bogus out politics. there. Politics, there you go. Especially politics. Poor Trudeau. Um, <laughs> Marco, I'm behind you like a creep. Here you go. Hi, I just um, had a question about motivating employees and things like that. Uh, just wondering if you had any insights into motivating employees that don't have equity in the company or, or just have like a flat salary, if you will, because it's easier to be motivated to work the Saturdays if you've got skin in the game. Uh, wow. Um, well, that's certainly the case, but I, I haven't found it to be automatic, you know, where you just hear, hear some equity and automatically people are working on Saturdays. That, you know, they still have bills to pay and so on. That, that isn't the sufficient, nor do I believe in that ticker tape culture where you're sitting there looking at your stock portfolio every day. That's not going to drive people. Um, you really have to go back to like something basic, a tool like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where, you know, you've got a person who can't make rent is not going to be able to solve your parsing problem. They're, they got, they're, that's what's driving them there, right? Or has problems on the family fronts or anything like that. They're going to be distracted. So 
a lot of a lot has been written in this area, like Daniel Pink writes about this, where when you get someone and you're going to put them in an environment where they work on problems that you give them, can you eliminate everything else in their lives that, that you know, could be distracting them for that? Now, there are things you, that you can definitely do, like, you know, you can, you can have shuttle bus services so they don't have to worry about transportation, and Google gets to the point where, you know, there's laundry service at the office and things like that. That's all there to just remove all the other distractions. They're like, no, we, you worry about things we pay you to work on. Um, but again, you can only create the environment. Um, you could take a person and put them in a program they don't believe in, like, hey, you're working on nuclear guidance systems, and they're like, I don't want to kill people, I don't want to work on that. that you, there's nothing you could do to get them to actually be there on Saturday for that. But if you can, un you take the interest and get to know the team and align their interest to what you're doing, that's why recruiting is incredibly hard and, and finding that type of alignment, so. Yeah, just to touch on that, I mean, I, you know, culture has been one of the biggest fundamental building blocks of the success of our business. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, uh, being able to create an environment in which people are doing meaningful work that they believe in and actually enjoy is super important. Um, you know, creating their overall uh, work-life happiness is, is what us leaders should be focusing on. Um, and yeah, like, you know, retreats and all that cool stuff is great and, and unlimited food and, and, and a juice bar and all that stuff is, is, is awesome uh, to remove distractions. But, if they enjoy the things that they're doing on a daily basis and they know that the work that they're doing solves a problem or helps uh, people in the real world, that's going to be something that, you know, uh, motivates them. I mean, the only thing I would add to that is like culture definitely and at some point though you've got to show them the money. Yeah. So, uh, Easy gotta, does it, Jerry. Uh, right, like 100%, like yeah. I think that's 80% of the solution. At the end of the day though, like how do you design your incentive comp structure, how do you think about having a pool where you do recognize the top performers. Um, I, I do think you can't skirt around some of those fundamental economic issues. I think that's really fair. And like a lot of people, you know, try to shy away from that. But money is money, right? Like at the end of the day. And oftentimes, a lot of these perks that are in place are for certain teams. And, and you know, you see a sales team having incentive trips or a president's club. And, you know, the poor marketing team has nothing. And I think um, it's really important to kind of create a culture where there's um, shared experiences. And that's a great way of building culture. Um, I've built a few teams where we used to just do things like we would have breakfast, but we would invite another um, team along with us, so we would treat them out for breakfast, and that was just a simple thing, or um, offering everyone on the team $10 to take someone else out for coffee, just not on the team, right? So little things you can do, I think, that are always great for enhancing culture. Um, I, there's usually two questions asked per section, so if you do have additional questions, these guys, I think, will be sticking around afterwards, so feel free to ask them, otherwise we're going to be here all day. Uh, and <laughs> so Sorry, I saw you and there's someone back there as well. I do apologize. Um, the next part of the evening is kind of like where we break it up. So you turn to your left or behind you and talk to someone you don't know for two minutes. It gives you a bit of a break. If you need to use the bathroom, please be back as quickly as you can because we're going to get started. Oh, scaling. Did I say the last section was scaling and it was actually career path? I may have done that. I realized that afterwards. Um, but scaling, and we don't mean scaling, um, well, I was thinking that. <laughs> Your name is? Gertie. Oh, Gertie, that's such a Gertie joke. <laughs> um, and a Bindi joke, that's a typical dad joke, that's why I enjoyed it. Um, so. This part of the evening is kind of describing um, the challenges you've overcome, which we kind of touched upon in the last section, but more so um, in as you grow the company, not your career. So I'm going to just kind of jump right into it, and we'll do a similar format. We'll ask a few questions. We'll open it up for Q&A, and then jump into a meet the neighbor. How was the last section for everyone? Yeah, enthusiastic crowd. I love it. Everyone's so tired. Um, just me. Okay, so the first question I had posed was uh, in regards to challenges. Describe the most difficult challenge that you overcame in your first few years of business. And 
Yeah, this is a challenging moment, I know. Um, but I'm sure that you've got some more stories that we'd love to hear. And, you know, if you can share them, that'd be great. Um, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Uh, I mean, the, I, I can't point to one challenge that was giving me, a, giving me nightmares. Was, but, you know, part of the thing was you would have these moments of lucidity where you'd go like, oh, my God, I totally get it. That's the product. That's the problem. Those are the people we're going to go after. And then you'd hold on to it for a moment, and then it was gone. Like, the next day, five things you thought of all sound dumb to you, let alone walking into a room trying to convince other people that that's what we should be doing. Um, the, the thing is, that statement where looking in hindsight, things are obvious, but looking forward, there's, there's no obviousness at all, at all is, is the biggest challenge. That notion of, I believe we can accomplish X, and these are the ways we can do it, it is never a straight line. And the challenges having, to me, to us at least, was dealing with the internal conflicts where everybody had slightly different opinions on what you should do. Some very, very daunting and scary, and none of us having any clue how to do that, but making a group commitment to go try to do that and spend company resources, personal resources, and try to do that, that was very daunting. Um, and we realized there were only a certain number of bets we could make. You, you, we, we didn't have the luxury to try 15 things out. We had the luxury to maybe try two or three. And if those three didn't pan out, that was it. The company was done. And everything we'd done for the last year or two was done. Um, I can't think in the absence of that external clarity how, you know, there are books written on how you go about doing this. But every, on, every enterprise's journey is going to be completely unique. And um, that, that was uh, unbelievable that we came out of that unscathed. I still look back, sometimes surprised. So. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that comes to mind uh, being the most challenging is, you know, when our company was fairly small, we had two different offices spread over two different countries, Vancouver and LA. And, you know, in the beginning stages when you're building the foundation of your company, I think it's very important uh, to be under one roof. So you can really solidify that culture and that high performance culture and how you want people to uh, really you know, engage and, and, and perform with each other. Uh, so you know, collaboration, communication, and most importantly, culture kind of suffered. You know, we had uh, leadership in, in two different cities and um, you know, there, was, there, was, there was a lack of that camaraderie mm -hmm. with that in-person connection. Uh, so yeah, I think that was, you know, beyond obviously at early stages, capital is always a challenge, but um, definitely, you know, running two different offices in two different countries with a fairly small team was uh, one of the biggest challenges I can, I can think of right now. That sounds really tough, um, especially for setting up the foundation. I always think of like setting up a company like going into a marriage of sorts, right? If you've got a, if you've got a rocky foundation, it kind of starts falling apart. I'm sure you worked your way through it, but um, how did you work your way through that? Fuck, living on an airplane. <laughs> well, that sounds like a marriage for sure now. Well, I mean, I mean in, in all honesty, we, we uh, just recently decided to uh, move our Vancouver operations to LA full time. Yeah. Uh, to have everybody under one roof. You know, I, I, throughout this process, I always look back and say, you know, if I were to do this again, what would I do? Um, and that was one of the things that my partner and I really wanted. We wanted everybody under one roof. So, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to be able to bring a large portion of our Vancouver team to LA and get them visas and all sorts of stuff. So. Um, it's, it's, it's exciting. So that's kind that's of how we're dealing with yeah, it. Yeah, that's an expensive way to deal with it. Yeah, um, well worth it. But, you know, I was going yeah. well, to say it was well worth it. I'm from Kits to Venice Beach. That's fun. I'm just guessing. Am I right? No. No? Where are you guys going in L.A.? Uh, we're actually building uh, uh, downtown. We're building an yeah. office and gym, live streaming studio all in one. Uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about culture, and I think it's a it's unique the business we're in. We're we're a media and tech company, and essentially like a talent agency because we represent trainers and athletes and social influencers and stuff. So um, we wanted people to walk into this atmosphere and understand like it's a place to improve yourself, and uh, and that starts internally, right, with our staff. We want them to be excited about coming to work and knowing that they're surrounded by uh, a community and this environment in which that we promote growth and constant progress, so um, that's what we're doing. 
That's awesome. That sounds very exciting. When is this all taking place in the next year or so? Uh, we're <laughs> I'm asking all the tough questions. Yeah, yeah, it's all I feel like no, Barbara it's, Walters. It's, uh, we like to uh, move quick because the industry and the market moves quick. So yeah. we plan to be fully operational in our new spot by June. Wow. Well, congratulations. Fully, fully built out and ready to roll. That's amazing. Um, Ian, do you want to answer the question? I, I can ask it again no, if you no, remember. Yeah, okay. Scaling. Um, I think anytime you create a startup, you have a vision in mind of what you want to do, right? Yeah. So for us, it was how, what would it take for us to turn real estate completely liquid so that people can buy and sell with a click of a button so they can move whenever they want to? Okay, that's like a pretty big vision. Um, now, there are really big risks. And so the whole point of a startup is to actually de-risk all these fundamental hypotheses that you had to make in order to like make this end state happen. And so what are some of these big risks? There was customer like risk. Do customers actually want this? <laughs> we think they want it, but do they actually want it? Then there was technical risk. Can you actually build the software algorithms to make this happen? And there's a team risk. Can you assemble the talent that, to make this happen across products, biz dev, um, you know, engineering, data science, et cetera? So, there are scaling challenges across all these dimensions, but I think fundamentally for most startups, it's actually product market fit, which is to say, do customers actually want this product? <laughs> um, and most startups actually just fall flat because you know, they, they just can't answer that question. So for us, you know, the zero to one, I would say a lot of it was talking to customers. Like, hey, we're open door. We want to give you fair market value for your house. It can close whenever you want. Why do they say no? Like really obsessing on the why customers may say no, and how you need to adapt your pitch or your product to, to help them realize that, hey, this is a great option for them. That was really zero to one. Um, then, you know, one to 10, 10 to 100, you, know, you start getting more of the kind of team culture challenges because now not only do you have to create a product, you have to create the engine that creates the products. Um, and that introduces a whole set of things. For instance, there's a notion of Dunbar number. You can, humans can keep track of 100, roughly 140 names in their heads and develop relationships with 140 people. Now, if your company scales beyond that, actually you no longer can physiologically have this intimate relationship with your coworker. So then how do you actually develop mechanisms that scale information, scale roadmaps, scale um, how we work? And you know, that, that becomes a whole set of different challenges, but that's kind of- And you're at 1300, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, all the same themes, I think, uh, come to play, which is, you talked about two, two cities that I feel your pain, that's tough. And um, it's, what becomes challenging, especially as, as team grows, teams grow, is when you're small, you don't, everyone just knows each other, and everyone always assumes good intent, right? Like, like I trust you, I see you. You tell me, like, your struggles, hence, I understand when you miss this thing, like, I'm not gonna, you know, spaz about it, right? But um, when a team grows, you no longer can even physically see the other individual. That's where you really have to build the culture so that people don't have to rely on being in physical presence um, to, to build stuff. It was a really eloquent way of um, how you describe building a startup and uh, removing the risks. Like you said, de risking. What was it? Yeah, it's de-risking. Like yeah. you have to assume a bunch of things. Like you have to assume A times B times C equals output. Yeah. <laughs> but these are all assumptions, and you have to go back and say, like, how do I prove A? How do I prove B? How do I prove C? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's really fascinating, and um, the challenges I think uh, you know all three of you kind of touched upon is um, how do you scale? Um, whether you're early stage, much like Cam, or you're at a stage where you've got 1,300 uh, employees, um, how do you continue to scale that culture? Because I think that's key to um, what you guys have all spoken about. Um, with that being said, was there uh, a pivotal moment when you recognized that your need to scale, whichever stage you're in, um, it could be early stage or the later stage, um, when you're like, okay, I can define that as the exact moment when we move, we need to raise money or we need to do this to get us to the next point. Well, um, you know, we would, you know, I'm gonna talk about Mojo in, in this regard, out of the gate had to scale. We, we're a product that's dependent on cars and then depend on cellular networks and then, you know, then our product sits on top of that. So even to get out there and do something, we had to get telcos on board 
and we had to work around the automotive um, industry and, and their issues. So we, we didn't have a choice, um, but part of the thing was um, how do you even test out something until you have product market fit? This was the challenge. Um, this is where we literally recognize that we are not going to get anywhere unless we can go talk to these big companies and actually ha get them to take us seriously. So I have a, a Goldilocks story in Canada. I mean, we, we were in a little dungeon of an office in, in Gastown over the Rebel Room where at 4.30 in the afternoon some band comes and practices, so you know. And, and we had executives from Rogers, Telus, and Bell. We managed to get them to come and visit us. Uh, one, after they look at, at our website, didn't even bother showing up. <laughs> the, the second took one look at our office, politely put his coat back on and <laughs> walked out. And this third actually stuck around, heard our pitch, uh, realized we're not joking in terms of like, we want to connect all the cars on the planet to the internet. And you know, this is in 2013 and uh, went, wow, uh, had three hours of questions of which we had intelligent answers to and said, I will take a chance on you guys. What do you need? And we had a long list of asks and, you know, we were fortunate to have somebody who, who let us do that at, at an executive level, um, took a chance on us. So immediately, you know, having a business where without someone of that level that can scale, we, we were a non-starter, so. Are we in their home right now? I cannot mention. Oh, I can't okay. confirm nor okay. deny. Just curious. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think that's really important is like, you know, um, people taking that chance on you, whether it's a customer or an investor, and that um, that's key to this. Um, Cam, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we were in a bit of a unique position uh, building a platform where we had two sides providing value to equal the equation. Um, so we needed trainers to supply workouts to bring on community members. We needed more community members to, uh, f you know, to follow these workouts so the influencer would get paid. Uh, so it was a bit of the chicken and egg where we needed a bunch of trainers that were super expensive to onboard, mm -hmm. but we needed the consumer to pay them. So, um, you know, really when we figured out when we wanted or when we had to scale, not necessarily when we wanted to was, I mean, when we had process adherence, when, when we were able to do things and do them well mm -hmm. and do them well repeatedly, we knew we could add more to that equation. So, um, yeah, I think like process adherence and always being nimble and adaptable and learning as you go is super important, uh, especially for getting prepared to scale. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of what you guys said makes a ton of sense. It's kind of what we did as well. Um, the other thing that we like to do at Open Door is working backwards. So, um, working backwards from say a 20 year vision that this ability to buy and sell with a click of a button should exist anywhere. Okay, that's 20 years out. What's, what should exist five years out? So, five years out, we should be nationwide in the, in the United States, hopefully Canada. Um, but this ability to buy and sell should be available nationwide. Okay, work backwards. Okay, what's, what's next for? Three years, okay, we should be available in 50 markets. And so then, so that there's a working backwards uh, exercise, but also what needs to be true for us to take that next stage? So to your point, the unit economics gotta work. Like, you gotta have a playbook that scales. And so we were very focused on working backwards, say, hey, these are the milestones that we should be hitting. And also what needs to be true for us to like, approach that next milestone? Um, so early days was like, do we have a repeatable playbook that was super important? Because in these operationally heavy companies where you're producing content or you're, you have a pretty op heavy operational workforce, you need to make sure that you can actually like copy and paste. And if you're not, then actually you have one problem. We, our first pro um, city was Phoenix. A until we solved Phoenix, we, if we launched Dallas, we would have two problems. <laughs> we, we need to make sure that we're solving one problem at one time. So um, it's a mix of working backwards and, and making sure that you um, identify what, what you are trying to learn as you're scaling. If I could add to that, it was a lot like, you know, I, I looked at it like an engine and you can run that engine at 10 RPM and if it's already making squeaky sounds, uh, revving it up to 100 RPM is a bad idea and, and businesses are a lot like that and what, what you just spoke about working backwards is exactly the guidepost. That's where it's not always a straight line, you're working towards the next milestone and in that journey you actually do alter your future path but that's part of the natural process. You have to distill 
you know, in, in many ways, it's very easy to look at the end destination, like BHAG type stuff and big, hairy, audacious goal. That's what I mean. Um, but it's a lot harder to figure out the intermediate steps. And that, that actually is, um, that was hours and hours of debates and long conversations that was not sitting in coding, which is what I know how to do. This I don't know how to do. This is like we're sitting here debating, so. The, um, the few questions I had, I think you guys kind of all touched upon in the last section. Um, I'm just gonna close off this section um, and then open it up to some questions. But if you could share a lesson learned about scaling, if you could sum it up, one thing. Well, <laughs> Um, there is, there are phases. So what worked at a certain phase will potentially stop working at a later time. You know, when you're a 10 person company, it'll just stop working and it'll stop working suddenly. So, um, and, and vice versa. Now, the other thing that happens is you, you, at a certain stage, you're sitting there going, wow, we just blew 10 grand today. And you know, whether it was meetings or whatever it was, and you will blink an eye and next thing it'll be you're, you're at 10 grand every 10 minutes. And you as an individual haven't scaled at the pace that your organization may have in terms of your intellect and your ability to let go certain things and take on new level of problems that are coming at you at that pace. Um, so one of the things I had to deal with was not just the business growth, but your personal growth as well throughout that. That was shocking to kind of uh, just let go of certain things that, you know, you're, you know how to do and are perfectionists about, for example. So. Such as? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'd, I have stories of where the CFO would be muddling with Excel and David would be, hey, Narayan, you worked on Excel, come, you know, do this. And I'd be sitting there going, I could do that or I could get this T-Mobile audit done so we can launch next week. What, you know, that, that's the, it's yeah. just very mundane things. That could you do you a pivot table? Yeah, got it. So exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and that was basically along the lines of what I was going to say in terms of, you know, for your company to scale externally, you really need to be scaling internally. Uh, the individual performance of your team needs to be leveling up. Every level you take, you individually need to be stepping up and, and becoming a new version of yourself to take on these new challenges and, and, and learning a lot more from the market. Um, and then always being mindful of you know, quality and are you giving your community members and ecosystem the support it needs? Uh, a lot of the times when we're scaling, mm -hmm. you know, we want to add, 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 but, you know, we, we have to be mindful of not neglecting um, our, our community and our ecosystem and the quality in which um, we present our product or the content that we create. Yeah. Yeah, I love the internal kind of scaling um, aspects because I think that's so true. You have to kind of see around the corner and actually be that person before it arrives. Um, the other thing I would say that's specific about scaling um, is um, the thing, a challenge actually becomes growth hides a lot of issues. <laughs> um, when you're growing very quickly, it's very easy to say, oh, we'll hire people mm -hmm. or, you know, it's okay, you know, we'll just like, somehow like the numbers are going to look good. And that's where, when sloppiness comes in, sloppiness in hiring a lot of people, sloppiness actually in managers thinking that all they need to do is hire. Um, there's a framework that actually Keith taught me, which is um, a manager's output equals the output of the team divided by the number of people in the team. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important as you're scaling to maintain quality, and you, ha you have to develop some type of framework to make sure that you can actually hold people accountable to the quality so that they're not, there's like scaling by eating a ton of junk food and actually scaling um, you know, the, the right way. Using Fit Plan. Yeah. It's such a good in, right? Like, I just had to go for it. Um, any questions? In this, okay, we've got one already at the, two in the front. That was quick. I'll go over here first. Nathan? Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what advice would you have to uh, first-time founders uh, with nothing but an idea and a whole lot of passion? I would highly recommend getting a mentor group, uh, advisors, mentors, uh, unless you're going to Mars where it's like no one's done that yet, chances are somebody's done it. Um, of some, it Maybe just an aspect of it. Um, that, that was immensely helpful to me at various points in my career. And having the right mentors, frankly. Uh, and these are people who 
are just trying to help you for altruistic reasons, uh, not necessarily, you know, yes, you give them stock options and all that, but they really believe in what you're trying to accomplish. I'd also say, you know, finding a really, really great partner that can, um, you know, pick up the slack in terms of where your weaknesses are uh, and highlight your strengths is super important so you don't get caught up wasting your time on things you're not good at anyway and things that you don't enjoy. Um, that, was, that was fundamental in, in, in starting our company. The only, I, the only thing I would add, totally agree on the co-founders, advisors, um, is just start small. I think a lot of times, you know, uh, you can get ahead of yourself. We certainly got it. Like, there's so many ideas that are available. I think the most challenging piece is identifying the first small step and just like take that. And because chances are, the first step you're going to take are in the wrong direction. It's going to be in the wrong direction. And um, truth is, you're probably going to have to iterate a lot. And are any of you looking for mentees? <laughs> are any of you looking to mentor? Well, I know well, somebody. Uh, uh, yeah, let me, you know, it's not like you put yourself out there and put an ad saying, you know, looking for mentees. It's usually mentees contact you and, and you resonate with what they're trying to do. That's what ends up happening. So, My advice in finding a mentor, though. Short answer, yes. Sorry. Yeah, like <laughs> find somebody that uh, not only has uh, experience in your space, but that you can really relate to and connect with yeah. and has gone down a similar path that you're about to go down. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of mentors out there that have fancy resumes and stuff, but uh, haven't been through the journey. And the journey is really where you learn most of the stuff that's going to help. I would say just have lots of coffees with people before you uh, have a relationship. Is Connie still here? No, she left. She left? Oh, there she is, Connie. Ian, Connie wants to meet you. She literally was waiting for you. I was going to use a word, but I'm not allowed to use it, she said. Um, Corey, put your hand down. Let the lady go. Um, first and foremost, you guys, this, this whole discussion right here, this is amazing. Thank you so much for all of your time here. I'm going to add you on LinkedIn tomorrow morning, so remember Kimia, K-I-M-I-A. Okay, um, this, this is great. Okay, so my question is, uh, coming from startup tech companies, I worked for entrepreneurs who have been very successful, great ideas, great solutions and products. What do you do when it comes to your sales processes? Just as you said, Ian, like, yeah, do customers like our products? Like when we put it out to the market, what, is the, what are the responses do we get? It's still my passion, it's still my product and solution. What do you do when it comes to actually selling it? What, what happens in that sales? Because sometimes what, what I've found in tech industry especially is that entrepreneurs, Focus a lot about engineering and, uh, excuse my accent, development and web designers and all that. And they don't look so much into, uh, or marketing and, and putting into investment money into marketing, a little bit into s sales. So what happens when you guys look into about actually s selling it? Because that's where you make money. Can I, uh, with all, I would love to know all, all three industries. I mean, I fundamentally think a product, when you start a product, you have to be able to, and this is something I learned from Eric, who's the CEO of Open Doors. He's a great way of thinking about products, which is imagine you are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a customer, and you're literally just describing your product. What would make that customer say, yes, I really want this? And if you can't pass that sniff test, like, you don't really have a product. And as I was trained as an engineer, and, like, obviously, it's almost like, if, you, if you've got a hammer, everything looks, looks like a nail. So by training like engineers and t folks that are technically minded, we'll always like, navigate towards the technical solution as being the thing to solve. When in fact, actually, what needs to be solved first and foremost in the company is, again, what is that one-liner yeah. or that like, five-minute conversation that will convince a customer to say yes? So I mean, I, I think uh, there has to be alignment in the company that that, that is important. Um, I don't know. Like, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, one of the best things that I got told was, I was that way, my training is engineering, I find a piece of technology and I get into it. At least that was startups one through four, and then I learned. Um, you know, someone told me that don't fall in love with the, with the technology, fall in love with the problem. And then when you've fallen in love with the problem, the people who have that problem, you can start forming a mental model of them. and. 
you can work with a mental model. It's always better to work with a physical person who has genuinely got that problem because then they become your, they kind of become your co-product uh, manager. They're helping you define that product. Uh, the challenge then becomes is are they representative of the broader market or is this just one person who needs a hat with a whatever funny thing in it? I mean, you know, this is, this, that's the product process uh, side of it, which in turn then, if you go through the product process, you will <laughs> typically have a, a typical sales model. So if your product is consumer to consumer or business to consumer or consumer to business to consumer, whatever that is, there are only certain channels that are available to you. In our case, we tried going direct to the consumer market. That didn't work. We tried that for two years and burned close to $5 million doing it. And then we realized, no, we've got to go through the Telus's and the Rogers and the T-Mobiles. So you're not always going to get your path to market right. But first product, then channels, and you've got to just work through that process. At least that worked, what worked for us. And, and I mean, like having, having a good story to tell um, that's relatable to your consumer, I think is important. Uh, a lot of the times we tell our story that may not be relatable. So, you know, calling bullshit on yourself and being like, okay, really, what is that story? What problem am I trying to solve? Um, is something that we continually find ourselves doing. Uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, maybe if, if you have a great product, maybe you're not just selling it enough. But again, in business, I, I feel like everything has a sense or smell of sales. When you're onboarding staff, you're selling a dream, it, especially in the early days when you don't even have a product, it's just some fucking wild vision. Like, hey, join my team, it's gonna be the next billion dollar business, show me something, I got nothing to show you. Um, you know what I mean? So it's, and, and the story's gonna change as your business evolves. Um, so it's important to just stick to what you believe in, um, and that story, if it's a, a good compelling story, should sell itself. Great question. Um, I'm going to add to that as a salesperson. I think one of the things that a lot of tech companies don't do is they don't engage sales early enough. And I, I've met with a bunch of founders locally now that I'm like, you actually should be talking to salespeople or biz dev people right when you're like putting product and figuring out market right from the get-go, not um, six months after development when you're you're like, hey, we have this thing that we need to sell. No, engage a, a salesperson, not an expert, but just a salesperson early on to have those conversations. And it's something that we don't do enough because sales is still a dirty fucking word. Uh, next slide. And Connie, you're going to have to engage with him. I did call you out. Now you know. You see each other. We got to go. Sorry. I'm so sorry. We just got to keep it going. Otherwise, we're going to be here late. Um, I think it's one more slide. Sorry. So we're just going to do a quick meet your neighbor just to break it up. Connie, come on up and talk to Tim one-on-one. See how we did that? Um, and thank you so much. We're gonna, we have one more section after this. So this section was supposed to be Silicon Valley versus Vancouver. You know, a uh, fair pairing. Um, but rather than jumping into it too deep, but um, could you kind of each of you go over what the strengths of Vancouver are versus uh, the Valley? And um, if you do have operations in Vancouver, why you choose to do so? And then we'll kind of wrap things up. Um, okay. yeah, Ian, I mean, you want to start? start? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I'm from Vancouver. I love the city. I Canadian. I invest it in this country. Um, I think generally, Silicon Valley, like if you think about Silicon Valley, the, the advantages are, are you know, the ecosystem is super rich. Um, there's lots of talent. It's very deep. There's venture capital. You can scale. But increasingly, it's unaffordable to be in Silicon Valley. It's crazy. Um, it's funny because Vancouver is not exactly cheap. But, um, but oh my god, like when I graduate or when I dropped on a PhD, like the rents that I could pay in SF versus the rent now is like literally over doubled in the course of the last nine, nine years. And so um, SF is just literally unaffordable. And by the way, the immigration policy in the United States is actually very, like becoming even more aggressive. And so I am actually very bullish on Vancouver being a tech hub going forward. And that's par partially why I'm here. Over, I'm hopeful that over the next year and a half that we will have an office and a presence in Vancouver. I'm actually very, very bullish on the scene here. Yeah, I mean, I'll second that. Vancouver's a beautiful city. Um, it's, you know, it's one of a kind. Uh, and I may be speaking out of turn here because I don't really know all that much about Silicon Valley. I've never worked in that, in that scene, but 
from what I do know, um, you know, obviously it's, there's a lot of incredible companies that come out of Silicon Valley. There's a ton of talent, very brilliant minds. Um, but one thing that I feel like we do quite a bit better than the Silicon Valley market is, you know, we tend to care a little bit more about our people in a sense of their happiness. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've heard multiple horror stories about, you know, to be a billion dollar business, you gotta treat your people like shit and work them to the bone. <laughs> um, that's not true, by that's the way. A, that's in a manual somewhere? Yeah, that is, yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, uh, I, again, I don't know a lot about Silicon Valley, but I feel like, you know, Canadians just in general are nicer people. Canada, nice, done. Can you just repeat the question? Um, just, just stay, what are you, stay on topic. why do you think our, um, what are the strengths of Vancouver versus uh, the Valley, and if you have operations in Vancouver, in Vancouver, why do you have operations here? Well, you know, uh, I'm based here, and I founded the company, so that's why there's operations here. I mean, all the founders <laughs> of the companies I've been involved in have been here, but that's not a good enough reason, uh, obviously. And and Mojo now has offices in Silicon Valley, Vancouver, Seattle, and and Europe. Uh, the, the, the positives, look, there, there is a history to the Valley uh, going back to Fairchild Semiconductors. And if you think of that mentorship model where you know, a group of entrepreneurs founded companies 50 years ago in the Valley, and then there's another group of entrepreneurs, another and another, you've got multi-generational knowledge of building hyperscale businesses. And the level of sophistication is, is incredible. Like, I don't just mean technology. I mean, you can walk into a law firm and have a lawyer understand what you're talking about when you're talking, I'm, I'm going to be using Kubernetes, and I'm going to do this, and I need an open source license that lets me do such and such a thing. And there are sophisticated um, individuals there. That is just a function of concentration. When, when you have a gold rush town, um, you're going to get people congregating there. So if you were to scoop uh, you know, a group, group of people in the Valley and scoop a group of people in Vancouver, just, just through that concentration, you're going to get uh, a lot more of the types of people there. Um, having said that, there is a little bit of echo chamber. There's a little bit of you know, um, ideas that there's a little bit of incestuousness going on in just ideas and, and even business where, you know, I sell you something and your business sells me something and we both have the same VC. So did we really create value or was this just money moving around in circles and we're doing logo exchanges? So I, I, I see that. Um, I've stayed here for personal reasons. Uh, aging parents, only child. My parents live here and I want to be close to them. I also got addicted to sailing, and we've got some of the best sailing in the world. And, um, you know, honestly, if it was sunny all the time, I would not get as much work done. So six months of rain <laughs> is awesome. I don't mind working six months, uh, you know, around there. You have to work towards your strengths. Um, there is a lot of BS in the Valley. There's a lot of smack talk. Um, you know, if you're on a court playing at the NBA level, somebody's going to come to you and say you're not good enough. And honestly, if you'd believe that, you've already lost the battle. Um, there are great people here. Um, honestly, I would get up at 6 in the morning and have meetings in the Valley. It was easier for me to get to Silicon Valley than to get to Victoria, as an example. So that physical barrier is really not there. Um, by the way, with Nexus, you can show up at the airport and be at your gate in seven minutes. I've, I've timed it, I've done it several times, and you can do it in seven minutes. So, um, you know, so you have to look at all of those as um, it's a mental barrier, it's not a real barrier. Secondly, uh, I think it's a lot harder for the Americans, you know, we had board members and so on in the Valley, it's a lot harder for them to come to Canada, they have a lot more business going on in that region. Get on a plane, get down there, go spend a week, that is not at all hard, so. Uh, lastly, I'll leave it at this. Think about the entire Cascadia region. Think about Silicon Valley, you know, all the way down to San Diego. San Diego, LA, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Vancouver. There is great talent. We're all in the same time zone. And, you, you know, with people not driving to work anymore, like I've been in, on the highway on 101, stuck for two and a half hours. There are a lot of people working from home in the Valley, and there's virtually no difference when you're using conference calling, whether it's Vancouver, Victoria, or the Valley. So much easier today than 10 years ago. Got it. Great. I think that's it. We're not going to ask any questions, because I, I think you guys are about to be like attacked like the Jonas Brothers. Round of, of applause for these speakers. What a great night. Thank you, gentlemen.